just here. You're so wonderful to be here tonight. We brought here, we gathered here for our wonderful family. We're going to have a wonderful time. We're going to bless them with the love of Christ, bless them with the giving of our hearts and our love. Amen? Amen. And we've got a wonderful band to start off the evening. I know it's Saturday, but the band's another Sunday. So please welcome another Sunday. Fun. Good evening, everybody. You guys like music? I'm with you. Why do you seem to look my way? Why are you so, so far away? When you speak, I watch the words appear. When together, Time can disappear Cause when I look towards you My heart and head feel fine I know just what to do Fine Keep my eyes on you Fine Smile when you are near Fine Just because you're here Why do I look the other way? Why do I go when I should stay? When I look towards you, my heart and head feel fine. I know just what to do. Fine, keep my eyes on you. Fine, smile when you are near. Fine, just because you're here. Because you're here, fine. I know just what to do. Fine. Keep my eyes on you. Fine. Smile when you are near. Fine. Just because you're here. Oh, thank you so much. I forgot I had my big shoes on. I keep missing my buttons. <laughs> the shoes are too wide. Mike's wearing clown I'm shoes sorry. tonight. I'm going to shrink about half an inch. I told him, take your socks, shoes and socks off, and he said not until he gets a pedicure. <laughs> you don't uh, want that. Yeah, I know. Could I share ugly. some things up here when I got a microphone in my face. Yeah. But I probably shouldn't. <laughs> yeah, well. This next song we're going to do is called Still. Um, I wrote it. Um, I wrote it basically to God, asking Him to change me, um, because I had been the words of the song are foolish ways, um, and God, uh, God does that for me every day, actually. <laughs> I'm looking for this life you saved. 
Believing more than chance to change And clinging to that one last thing Release my will, your peace then bring Change my foolish ways And make my heart remain And I will never be alone And chase my hard-fought days And keep my life unstained And I will never be alone And I will never be alone Looking for this life you saved And leaving more than chance to change And clinging to that one last thing Release my will, your peace then bring Thoughts again and Stay a while And look away And I will never Lose my faith Let my Mind regain Hold fast your own grace And I will never lose my faith And I will never lose my faith Thing. Release my will, the peace then bring Looking for this life you save
waiting and wondering where you are sitting and seeking and saving memories demeaning disastrous disdaining thoughts break through and hoping and having holding on to you love rain down rain down show us who you are in the darkest times of life Longing and lasting and loving to calm the storm, raging and thrashing waves of hurt and scorn, tasting life's terrors, only just rewards and changing and choosing his path. Heading towards love, rain down, rain down. Show us who you are in the darkest times of life. Love, rain down, rain down. Reveal to us your love. Quiet down, I'm bleeding. The quiet in the storm is the Jesus born to us. The life of one who lives, the only one to give for us. Love rain down, rain down, and show us who you are. In the darkest times of life Love rain down, rain down Feel to us your love By a town I'll be so Love rain down, rain down Show us in the darkest times of life Love rain down, rain down Feel to us your love Quiet down our bleeding soul guys enjoy dinner? If you had dinner, I, I mean, if you had it at your house, then good for you. I, I guess I'm happy about that, too. But <laughs> Dinner was awesome. Thanks, guys. Those ribs were really good. Who did that? That, that was incredible. Nice job. <laughs> Round of applause for the ribs. I was impressed. <laughs> Not my ribs, because I haven't seen them in a while. Yeah, that's, you know, that's a personal problem. It's a, it's, it's a weight issue.
help me Do you believe I I stepped out of bounds I put myself on the holy altar My clothes are torn I can't live without you I can't live beyond you I can't live without you Love. Heaven help me, it seems that I, I lost all my charm the Timing's off, I count to ten and I skip two and four I can I can't live without you. I can't love without you. I can't live without you. I can't love without you. I can't live without you. And your love. a challenge. It was fun. That was a lot of fun. I enjoyed that. <laughs> this next song is called My Time, and it's a song about, um, it's, it's a song I wrote about unconditional love. Um, just go ahead and take a listen. Hope you like it. This will be our last song tonight. you are so beautiful the world should see how wondrous is your love how much it makes me long for it my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there for me my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there how wonderful you are so wonderful the world should see look into your heart what I see is part of me my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there for me my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there You will be there. You will be 
vida to me because of who you are I want to give you all of me my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there for me my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there for me comes when my time comes I know you will be there for me my time comes when my time comes I know you will be there well thank you thank you very much thank you for having us Hey, thanks for coming. I'm Pastor Mike, a pastor of uh, the church here. We're glad to have you here. Uh, just awesome to uh, be able to come together and love, love for Christian, love for the Reigns family, and uh, come and help out a little bit and, and bear the burdens that, that are there uh, that life has brought. And so we're really, really glad to have uh, Dennis uh, come. Dennis Gaxiola is, is, is here tonight. And uh, when I told Dennis about the, um, this, what we're going to do here, he said, man, it would be an honor to come. And so I am really, really excited. And you know what? How many of you guys saw the commercial we did? The kids did it. How many saw it? Raise your hand. Okay, now look. They wanted to bring him on, too. So we're going to kind of like, can you get that video already? You ready for the video? The kids are going to bring on Dennis. So you got to really get into this. Here it goes. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. It is my pleasure to introduce to you a man who needs no introduction except to those to whom he has not yet been introduced. Dennis Cassiola. Dennis Comedian Dennis Gaxiola. Comedian Dennis Gaxiola. Thank you. Those kids sound like most of my teachers in school, so uh, <laughs> how's everybody doing? Give the band another round of applause. Give them. It's good to be here. Everybody ate okay? Everybody had a good? I, I had a great dinner driving up. I live in Fairfield. I, I had a, a Snickers bar and um, rock star. And, uh, and then I had to go healthy, so I had some uh, kettle corn. And uh, <laughs> so if I fall out any time, that's not the Holy Spirit, that's a diabetic coma. <laughs> Call 911, all right? <laughs> I'm a PK, I'm a preacher's kid. Every, every time I go to a church, people want to, oh, be careful, you know, it's a church. Don't say anything, you know, don't cross the line. I, grew, I was raised in church. I'm a Christian. I, was ra I know how to, any PKs? Where are the PKs? Where are the preacher's kids? So we need some security back here. And right over here. I want to know where the bad ones are first, you know. <laughs> My dad was a cool preacher because he grew up on the streets of Oakland. He didn't grow up in church. Sometimes, you know, churchy, churchy people, they ain't all there. <laughs> My dad grew up on the streets. He went from being a thug to being a boxer, from being a boxer to being a preacher. 
It was in the boxing ring that he saw the light. <laughs> said, I'm getting whooped. Help me, Lord. <laughs> this, is, this is what I do. I tell jokes, right? I, I, some, you know, there's different ministers that they're so anointed, you know, because every, everybody in here is gifted. Amen. If you know you have a gift from God, raise your hand. Everybody. Everybody sure. You, if you don't know what your gift is, pray. You'll find it out. My, my gift is jokes. That's it. I mean, there's some, there's some ministers are so anointed. If they pray for you, you'll fall out. I didn't get that one. Because God knows us. And he knows that my sense of humor. If he gave me that kind of gifting, I would abuse it. <laughs> if I was so anointed that I could pray for somebody and they would fall out. I go to the movies and there's a big head person in front of me. I'd be like... <laughs> In the name of Jesus. <laughs> I can see now. <laughs> I go to the DMV and there's a long line. I'd be like, oh, we about to have revival up in here. <laughs> I'm in front. <laughs> this is it. That's what I do with jokes. <laughs> I love the diversity in the room. I love that. That's a little bit of heaven. White, black, brown, Asian, all the different countries coming together. That's what heaven's going to look like. We're going to be in front of the throne of God speaking Spanish. It's going to be beautiful. <laughs> Had to slip that one in right there. <laughs> everybody, everybody getting used to uh, getting over the Christmas shock? Everybody got their Christmas or their credit card bills in? I got my credit card bills and I was like, wow, I love Christmas is my favorite time of year. I talk about Christmas all year long, but February is the hardest time to talk about it because at the end of January, you get the cre credit card like I spent that much money. I get into it. Don't anybody do Black Friday shopping? Black Friday? Just me. And, there was a lot more people at the mall, but. A few people are like, I was like, really? That's all? I got into it, man. Five in the morning, I was up out the house in line at the dollar store. I was. 10% is 10%, man. Don't judge. I took care of the whole family for 1950. Man. It was. Times are hard. <laughs> No, we're blessed, man. We, we took care of, you know, we, my wife and I, we went shopping. We had a babysitter, and all those sales, we took advantage of them. Filled up the car with gifts. The trunk with gifts. The back seat with gifts. We're driving home, and that one song they played during Christmas time to make everybody feel guilty. It's from Live Aid. Clap if you heard it before. It's like, do they know it's Christmas? Okay, one, two people have radio. Okay, this is... There is a spirit of slowness in this church right now, and we. <laughs> this is live. This is not Telemundo. You need to respond. They have one line in that song that'll tear your heart out. I'm driving, I got a car full of gifts, and that song comes on, and the one line that gets everybody is, do they know it's Christmas time in Africa? I got a car full of gifts, and do they know it's Christmas time in Africa? I felt bad. I went back to the mall, and I went to the calendar store, and I picked up a box of calendars, and I shipped that box to Africa. I said, I said, they need to know it's Christmas, man. It's about giving, man. You guys are just as wrong as me. I made it up. You laughed, all right? <laughs> My nine-year-old tried to act very humble during Christmas. He came to me with a little list. And he handed me the list like this. This is all I want. <laughs> six video games for his little Xbox. Six video games. 
you know, the video games are $60 a piece. He was trying to act like he was humble. That's all I want, Dad. $360 in video games. That's all he wanted. Coolest Christmas I ever had was when I was 10 years old. My dad was off work, and my dad, he was a convict, so... <laughs> I mean, only credit we had was for time served. You know, it was. Uh... <laughs> so when he was off work, there was nothing. You know, it was times were hard. He had, he had major back surgery. And Christmas every year, my mom and dad would tell us, look, don't expect much. But then there'd be one or two little gifts under the tree. This one particular year, particular year I'm 10 years old. And they said, look, we're not trying to trick you. You're not getting anything. Thank you, those that laughed at my pain. <laughs> but Salvation Army showed up on Christmas Eve. So, you know, little red kettle, Salvation Army? They, they showed up with a box of used toys. And when you're 10 and you don't expect anything, a used toy is as good as a new toy. Amen? And I got the coolest toy you can get back then. I got the electric vibrating football set. Where the man that had the electric vibrating football set? Okay. So all the young guys, they don't know what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's a piece of metal, painted like a football field, had an electric cord, you hit the switch, and all the players would go right across the field. <laughs> 20 minutes for one play. Because you had to fix the feet, because the little feet were plastic, little plastic. And if you didn't blow on each foot after, after the play, when you hit the switch, they would just go like this right here. <laughs> That would just be ridiculous. <laughs> so I was the happiest kid in America. I set up my electric football set, 20 minutes for the first play. I plugged it in. I hit the switch, and it didn't work. And I started to cry. My mom, though, she grew up poor, so she knew how to overcome situations. She got both my sisters, and they were kind of chunky. She got both my sisters. <laughs> And she made them stand right next to my football set. She said, your cheerleaders dance. And my sisters were going like this. My football players were going like this. I was the happiest kid in America. Man. At halftime, my sisters were crying because they were exhausted. I was crying because I was laughing so hard. That was the best Christmas ever, man. But now my dad had a problem because we had, we had gifts, but we didn't have a Christmas tree. He felt like he let us down. We went to sleep. I told you guys my dad was from the streets. He jumped the neighbor's fence and cut a tree down. <laughs> we woke up Christmas morning. It was like a miracle. Big tree in the living room. <laughs> and all the decorations were orange. It was an orange tree, sister. This is my easiest joke. I... That was the spirit of Martha Stewart over there. They were like red, green, gold, maybe blue, never orange. My dad was proud of that tree. This one came ready. I'm not ashamed to say I grew up poor. Anybody grow up poor? Ain't nothing wrong growing up poor. <laughs> grow up poor, you learn things you would not know if you had money. I was seven years old. The family car was a 1965 Chevy Impella that was not a lowrider <laughs> on purpose. <laughs> it was a hoopty. You know something about a hoopty? We had a hoopty. Big family, the car had no shocks. We bounced when we went down the street. Everybody thought my dad was hitting the switches. We just had no shocks. <laughs> Couldn't make a left turn because the steering column was messed up. You can't make up jokes like this. This is a testimony, all right? Couldn't make a left turn this hoopty, and I was in the second grade. Seven years old, I already knew that three rights equal to left. <laughs> Rich kids didn't know that. 
My teachers thought I was advanced. Like, he's geometry already. <laughs> you don't want to ask my dad for directions. He's like, okay, man, you make a right, and you make a right, you make a right, and you'll be all right. <laughs> we were poor. For dinner, all we had was helper. No hamburger, no tuna, just the helper. And it was good. You'd be like, Mom, could I have some more? She'd help yourself. <laughs> I like it. We got a lot of seniors here tonight. I like that. If the jokes don't work, I'll call out some bingo numbers and. Make everybody happy. <laughs> She's not laughing right there. She's like, all right. So I kind of 911 and deport you, Paco. <laughs> I just need some water now. Before I used to need, before I got saved, I needed alcohol to perform. I wasn't an alcoholic. I just drank all the time. And... Um, <laughs> Comedy clubs, they call tequila liquid courage. Take a shot before you perform. I don't need that anymore, just a little bit of water. Got Jesus in my heart now. Amen. And I never smile when I wasn't saved because I got crooked teeth. Now, don't come look at me after the event and testify. My teeth are so crooked, Jesus asked me to forgive him. He's like, my bad, dog. I'm going to hook him up in heaven. <laughs> Some of you want a crown. I'm hoping for a new grill when I get to heaven. Because <laughs> this is temporary, right, Pastor Mike? This is temporary, right? The Bible says we get to heaven, our bodies are healed, we're perfected. I get to heaven, there's a mirror. Uh, and my teeth are still crooked. I'd be like, forever, Lord? I mean, brother, when you get to heaven, don't you want to look in the mirror and go, God is good. Just... <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You want, you, you want it back, right? <laughs> Just... Work it out. You got to walk your faith out. Just go and practice. You got to practice for eternity every day. Look in the mirror and go. I'm in Bible school now. I go to Bible school up here in Sacramento. Lord opened doors for me to go to Bible. I grew up in a church about, about half the size of this right here. So with, my, my grandpa was the preacher. And he didn't even graduate high school, much less Bible school. And sometimes you go to a church like that, the theology is not that solid. You know? 20 years I went to that church. And on the pulpit, there's three cribs. It was church in East Oakland, little church, a lot of love there. Three crosses on the pulpit. A big Jesus cross and two little crosses for the thieves. <laughs> 20 years I went to that church. No one ever said why Jesus had a big cross and the thieves had little crosses. After 20 years, I was convinced the thieves were midgets. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to preach that my first sermon, Jesus and the little thieves. <laughs> That church collected a love offering and got me a scholarship to Bible school. So like, you, know, <laughs> you need to go study, man. Because <laughs> if you don't know the word, you can get tricked, right? You, can be, be, you better know your Bible. You don't know the devil knows the Bible. You better know the Bible. Like, I, I met my wife. She said she was from the Philippines. I said, ooh, she's a Christian. That's in the New Testament. <laughs> she wasn't saved, man. It's Philippians, sister. That's it's right by the Colosseum. It's right in there, right next to the Colosseum. <laughs> 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 
got any Filipino brothers and sisters here tonight? We got some Filipino brothers. Oh, I'm international. Come My boots. A lot of Spanish in Tagalog. You speak Tagalog? No. Of, who, where, where, where's my Tagalog speaking Filipino? A lot of Spanish in Tagalog, right? The very, Filipinos very proud of that Spanish heritage. It's a mixture of Spanish and, and chicken. It's a beautiful language. <laughs> <laughs> I listen to my wife when she's talking to her family in the Philippines. And I, I follow the conversation because I recognize some words. But then I lose her. You know, I'm going to Filipino. <laughs> She just clucked. I heard her. She was, she was clucking. <laughs> Did you cluck or the chicken cluck? I don't know. Cause <laughs> you have to understand if you have Filipino friends, neighbors, family members, co-workers, and they speak Tagalog, and English is the second language. Not everybody has the accent, obviously. My wife is from the Philippines, okay? And I've, I've come to find out that in Tagalog, in the alphabet, there's no F. So when they speak English, sometimes if English is a second language, especially if you tease her, like my wife, the F and the P get mixed up. I think it's cute. But after 12 years with me, boy, she had enough one night. I forgot she'd come to church with me to do, a, do an event. And she was in the back. As soon as it was over, we went into the lobby. She said, hey, just because you're popular and you're born. <laughs> <laughs> you don't make fun of my vocabulary. <laughs> what, what's a vocabulary? She said, oh, knock it off. <laughs> You're not perfect. <laughs> said, Baby, you, 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 your furpic's not perfect. <laughs> so oh, you want to point the finger? <laughs> you don't point the finger at me, <laughs> Mr. Furpic. <laughs> We have little ones, little girls, two little boys, little Mexipinos. <laughs> Brother back there is like, I had those on my nachos. <laughs> Chips, cheese, Mexipinos. <laughs> they look like her, thank God, they don't look like me. Only thing that came out like me are my daughter and my two boys, but especially my daughter, they got my eyebrows. Not baby versions. <laughs> They got big eyebrows like me right now. I got three Filipino Muppets sitting at home tonight. <laughs> she told my daughter, don't worry, when you get older, I'll fool them. <laughs> You'll be perfect. <laughs> My wife has a jealous streak in her. This is the wrong business to be in with a wife that gets jealous. She gets, she thinks, because she remembers me from my past when I was in the world. I got in trouble at McDonald's. You know how hard it is to get in trouble at McDonald's? <laughs> Fellas, you know how hard it is to get in trouble at McDonald's? Here's what I made the mistake of doing. Young lady behind the counter, I'm there with my wife, my kids, and here was my order. I didn't go give me a number three or give me a number four. I said, uh, let me get a quarter pounder with cheese, fries, and a Coke. That's all I said. We sat down. You know when your spouse is upset, the attitude changes. We sit down, and the attitude's a little different. What's wrong? She said, you were flirting. <laughs> now, I'm scared, so I got to ask her, flirting? Flirting with who? You could say number four, but no, French fries. 
I was shocked. You know, I was like, that, that, that girl has to be 16, 17 years old. She goes, I know, you furbert. I can't, I can't win that argument right there. <laughs> Where are the married folks at? Married, clap your hands. Married. <laughs> Marriage is a challenge. And the number one challenge that us men have, the number one complaint women have about us men is that we don't communicate. And I'm going to put an end to that lie tonight. Ladies, we communicate. Just not with you. Because we know if we say the wrong thing, it doesn't ruin just that moment. It could ruin a whole period of time. <laughs> I'll prove it to you. <laughs> I had a golf trip. It was just a local golf course with two of my uncles and one of my cousins. I had this trip planned for two weeks. I didn't tell my wife that I was going golfing till that morning. Early, I got up at 6 in the morning, washed up, got dressed, kissed her on the forehead, said, I'm going golfing. When did you plan this? Because you woke that woke her up. When did you plan this? I said, two weeks ago. You're barely telling me now? I said, why have you mad for two weeks? <laughs> I, said, I love you. <laughs> Look, he's done that back there. He did that too, huh? <laughs> he's like, see, I'm not the only one. <laughs> <laughs> My wife couldn't make it tonight. She had an appointment at a uh, Cash Creek. And um, <laughs> anybody been there? Anybody? Anybody? Okay, we got one on. This is that confession time. Anybody been to Thunder Valley? Okay. <laughs> Pastor, I, I went to Cash Creek. I don't like it anymore. I went. They tricked me. The devil's a liar. That's my excuse. I'm sticking to it. <laughs> The advertisement said Native American Indian Bingo and Casino. I said, I'm going to help my brothers, my Native American brothers. I'm going to help them. Three hours at Cash Creek, as far as I'm concerned, me and the Indians are even. <laughs> I didn't mind losing so much as the fact there were no Indians there. The whole idea about casinos in California is that they're Native Americans. They can do what they want on their land. So I'm thinking I'm going to some native land. I'm going to see some native things. You know, a TP, <laughs> a smoke signal, a bow and arrow. Only arrow I saw was pointing to the ATM. It's like right over here. <laughs> no Indians. The night I was there, everybody was Asian. <laughs> Sat down to play cards, and my dealer's name was On the name tag, there was an N and a G. No vowels. <laughs> That's why I lost, because I couldn't concentrate. I kept trying to sound her name out. <laughs> That's all I got every time. <laughs> I was at another casino, and I, I hit a jackpot. This is before I got saved, by the way, OK? <laughs> I was at a casino and I hit triple seven, 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 seven. I said, I wait, and nothing came out. So I hit the help button and the guy came over. I said, look, man, I got seven, seven, seven. I should have won something. He said, no, my friend, wrong casino. You need seven, eleven here. Seven, one, one. <laughs> I said, it was the different Indian. <laughs> We're going to have a prayer for addiction to gambling after this, okay? <laughs> I found out at 12 years old, didn't pay to be funny. My dad would go from church to church preaching. My dad was a heroin addict that was saved in a prison cell one-on-one -on -one with Jesus. No 12-step program, no, no recovery program, no withdrawals. He said, Jesus changed me, and boom, he was delivered from addiction to heroin and went on to preach the gospel for 40 years. So my dad would always go from church to church preaching, take one of his kids with him. I remember one Sunday, I'm 12 years old, big church, 500 people, and before my dad starts preaching, he looks at me and says, mijo, stand up and tell the church something about yourself. I'm 12. I'm scared. 
But my sense of humor kicked in. I stood up and I faced the congregation and said, my name is Dennis, and I'm an alcoholic. <laughs> Oops, wrong group. <laughs> there was some laying on the hands when we got home. <laughs> that was not an old happy day, I tell you that right now. <laughs> I remember another Sunday we went to a very conservative Presbyterian church, very conservative, predominantly white church, all older folks. And they would never have a comedian. They would never have a band like we had tonight. They had all the old-fashioned songs, you know, How Great Thou Art. <laughs> had a little sign language lady on the sign. How Great Thou Art. My dad was an old-school preacher. My dad was an old school Pentecostal, pulpit shaking, Bible thumping, spirit filled, speaking in tongues kind of preacher. My dad started preaching, very conservative congregation. My dad started preaching, Holy Spirit started moving. My dad started speaking in tongues, and the sign language lady got carpal tunnel syndrome right there. <laughs> She's like, time out, brother, we don't do that here, okay? Some of you don't know if you should laugh or pray that like. It's <laughs> one thing about comedy, you have to know the line. Travel across the country, I got to know the line. California was spoiled. This, this is what we deal with in California, diversity. We have friends and family from all walks of life. Other parts of the country, most segregated day of the week, Sunday. Still got to make them laugh, but you got to respect the line. Go to the South. It's a different ballpark. Go to an all-white church in the South. Now, when I say white, black, brown, we're all brothers and sisters, okay? That's, so, uh, you know, like I told you, we're going to be in front of the throne of God speaking Spanish. It's all one family. <laughs> Still got to respect the cultural line that we have right now. I believe there's good humor in our cultural and ethnic differences so long as there's no malice. If the joke's malicious, it's not funny. But we can laugh with each other, not at each other. We can have a good time, right? Got to know the line, though. Every culture has a line you can't cross. Go to an all-white church in the South, here's the line. Elvis Presley, Lady Di, Dale Earnhardt. That's the line right there. <laughs> you do one Dale Earnhardt joke, you hear banjos go off. <laughs> really, pastor, a shotgun? I was on BET, Black Entertainment Television, nine seasons. I was the Mexican on a show called Comic View. I know the line. Comfortable with my black brothers and sisters. Here's the line. All black church, Martin Luther King, President Obama, and hearing. And all black brothers and sisters very proud of the hearing to let you know. I heard that. They're very proud. <laughs> You can laugh, white folks. The black people are laughing, all right? You can laugh, all right? So I can see everybody. Everybody's like, are they laughing? Okay, can we laugh? They're going to march. He's going to make a march. <laughs> Go to a Latino church. That's my people. I know the line. Big Latino church. Here's the line. The Raiders, Selena, and Jesus. In that order. <laughs> You could talk to the most hardcore gang-banging cholo out there. You say something wrong about Jesus, he'd be like, hey, man, that's the Lord. That ain't right, Holmes. <laughs> <laughs> to go meet him. I was raised Christian. I, I, was, I was never Catholic, but I, I'm upset that the Pope is not Mexican. <laughs> Any Catholics here? Any of our Catholic brothers and sisters? Any recovering Catholics? <laughs> <laughs> Majority 
of Catholics around the world speak Spanish. Largest group of Spanish-speaking people, Mexicans. The Pope should have been Mexican. It would have changed religion around the world. First of all, the Pope Mill Bill would have been tricked out. <laughs> Virgin Mary airbrushed on the front, you know. <laughs> I got your mom, you know. Special hydraulics so the Pope could give the sign of the cross. Chee -chee, chee -chee, chee -chee, chee -chee. And with the Mexican in charge, it would have changed religion. Because with the Mexican in charge, you would have choices. You go to the front of the church with the priest to take communion. He'd be like, this is the body, corner flower. <laughs> OK, see, when you go to a Mexican restaurant and Because I can say, well, you like corner flower. <laughs> Growing up in a Christian family, everybody thinks, oh, everything was perfect. Your dad's a preacher. My grandfather, my mom's dad, I'm, you know, my mom's side, my grandfather, he was a pastor. So my dad got out of jail, went to church, and married the pastor's daughter. So I got all my whole lineage as pastors. you think that'd be a perfect family. My mom and dad had issues. But because of my dad's background, he never wanted to lose his temper. So if he got upset, he wouldn't get mad. He would just throw out a scripture or a biblical principle. I remember one Sunday, I mean one Sunday, one day, the weekend, it was on the weekend, and my, and my mom was on his case about getting some chores done around the house. And he looked at her and said, ye without sin cast the first stone. My mom was half Mexican, half Puerto Rican. That's the wrong thing to say to a Mexican. <laughs> when he said, ye without sin, cast the first stone, she said, Jesus is my rock. I'm sanctified and busted him upside the head. <laughs> Didn't get mad. He just gave her another principle. Seven times 70, I forgive you. That one stumped her, so she just said the first thing that came to her mind, well, until you do right by me. <laughs> that's not a scripture, that's Oprah in color purple. <laughs> you see some of the sisters, that's my favorite scripture. <laughs> I get my political views from my grandfather, a very wise old man from Torreon, Mexico. I went to my grandpa one day and said, Grandpa, what do you think about a woman's right to choose? He said, Mijo, I think everyone should wear shoes. <laughs> That's my best joke right there. <laughs> you know, Pastor Mike was going, don't go there, brother. Don't, don't. <laughs> All my Latinos are going, that was deep. <laughs> He's political. <laughs> it's an incredible time in American history if you look at it from a historical perspective, not a right wing or left wing perspective, but from a historical perspective. 50, 60 years ago, there was a civil rights movement. And civil, in 50 or 60 years, in a history book, could be a turn of a page. So if you look at it from a historical perspective, if the Lord don't come back for us or call us home, in 50 or 60 years or 100 years from now, when they read American history, we will have went from a civil rights movement to where we are today, a half-white president. I think that's incredible. <laughs> I call that chapter almost there. <laughs> well, everybody forgets that President Obama's half-white. They want to act like Flavor Flav got elected president, you know. <laughs> President Obama is a highly educated man from Harvard, okay? He's an Ivy League educated politician, not that different than a lot of other politicians in our country. But I understand the cultural pride. My nephew, half Mexican, half black, on the day of the first election, he called me up, Uncle Dennis, Obama's gonna win. I'm not going to work. <laughs> I 
My nephew's name is Nicholas. I said, Nick, Obama's from Harvard. You're in your fifth year of junior college. <laughs> Get back to the mall. Hot dog on a stick needs you, man. <laughs> Nothing wrong, wrong with cultural pride, amen? Nothing wrong with being proud of your tribe, okay? I mean, we're all one body of Christ, but while we're here on earth, there's nothing wrong with being proud of your culture. My grandfather came from Mexico. I, I tell, especially when I do get to work with high school or college-age students, I tell them, make your grandparents proud. Somebody put some hard work in to get you where you are today. So I tell people, make your grandparents proud. My grandfather came from Mexico. He retired from, from Vallejo, from Mare Island, from the federal government. He had a job working on submarines. He was proud of that, that he was an immigrant that got the clearance to work on submarines. I thought he was the captain. He was the janitor. That's not the point. All right. <laughs> but he never let the family forget that when he came to California, he picked fruit. Every summer, he would make my mom and all my uncles and aunts go pick fruit for their school clothes. Not because he needed the money, but to remind them of where they got their start in California. All these years later, I've been blessed. I got to go to college. I love technology. I served my country. I did 20 years in the Air Force. I got, I, I, look, I got my iPad with me. I got my, my, my Android phone. I got my computer at home. And I say all that so I can go on Facebook and play Farmville. <laughs> Just like Grandpa. <laughs> Anybody else play Farmville? Okay, there's, three, there's 50 million people signed up, but only four of us tonight, all right. <laughs> if you never played Farmville, don't. It's the crack of the internet, all right? <laughs> you start off, I'll explain the game. You start off with 12 little plots. It's a screen about this big, and you have 12 little squares, and you can plant your fruit and vegetables. And when they're ready, you pick them, you sell them at the market, you get money, you can buy a bigger farm. You could decorate your farm, put a house and tractors and trees. And I had the biggest farm you could get. And depending on what you plant, grapes are ready in 15 minutes. <laughs> Pineapples, four days. Everything in between. Like tomatoes, just a couple hours. I had the biggest farm you can get. And when you max out, they let you buy a second farm. So I had two farms, both of them fully decorated, mostly farmland. And I had just planted two farms full of tomatoes. And my wife said, let's go to the movies. I, I can't. She's like, why? I said, well, the, the tomatoes. Because if you don't pick your vegetables and your fruit when they're ready, they go bad, you lose your money. I said, we go to the movies, my tomatoes will expire. I lose. The economy is bad right now, all right? My grandpa came from Mexico. I'm not losing my farm for a movie. She signed me up for Celebrate Recovery after that right there. <laughs> but it's good to be proud of your heritage. You know, God has been so good to me. And uh, I got lost for about 20 years. I, got, I, I went through a divorce and... Uh, I, I remember literally thinking, you know what, I've been a good boy all my life. I went to Desert Storm, I came home, and my wife walked out on me, took my sons, went to Hawaii. And I literally just made a conscious choice, because I was wounded. I said, you know what, I've done, I've done all these good things all my life. I'm, I'm going to have some fun. Now, that, that was the devil playing off my wounds, you know, going, it's time to have fun. And... The way the Lord opens doors for you, the devil will open doors for you. Watch out who's opening your door, okay? Because it takes seven years. They say in comedy, it takes seven years to find your voice, you know, to find who you are on stage. And then you can start thinking about doing some TV appearances. In less than a year, I was on TV. And I, got start, I started working with some of the big boys in comedy. You know, I was getting to work with Jamie Foxx, Cedric the Entertainer, Paul Rodriguez, uh, Fluffy. You guys know Fluffy. I've known Fluffy since he started out. All these guys, I'm running around with them, and I forgot who I was. I forgot my identity because I was in the world looking for a new identity. We got to understand who our identity is. Uh, our identity is in Christ. Amen? Amen? Who we are and what we are is all about Christ. It's, it's an amazing thing when we start understanding who we are in Christ. Ephesians 
I love I love Ephesians. I'm gonna share a little bit if that's okay with you guys. We're in, we're in, we're in the church building. Can we have just a few minutes to understand our identity? Because if we don't, if A. W. Tozer has a great quote. A. W. Tozer, if he was written, if he was alive during the Bible times, he would have been the psalmist. He just had beautiful insight to God. He said, "We can never know who or what we are till we know at least something of what God is." You can't know anything about yourself till you understand who created you. Who created you? Amen. Got to understand that your about, something about your heart. God wants your heart. The heart is the inner man. It's, it's God, it's, it's the essence of who you are. It's God's originally intended dwelling place. That's where he wanted to be with man. But man, sin separated man and God. But he still gave his son for us so that he could clean up our hearts, our inner man, our sin nature, and have a relationship with us. It's so easy to try to understand our identity. We define our identity in our pretty shallow society that we live in. We, had, we identify our, 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 uh, our identities in our ethnicity, in our sports team. Well, I had fun this, this past few weeks teasing all my 49er friends. You know, my uncles that switched from the East Bay to the San Francisco, I gave them a hard time. And I, we, we, there was some tension. All of a sudden, our identities during Super Bowl time was whether you were a Niner fan or not. You know, we, whether you're from the East Coast or the West Coast, if you're Southern California or Northern California, we have a pretty shallow way of identifying ourselves in America. Amen? We got to understand as believers in Christ, our identity is so much deeper. Our identity goes all the way back to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Amen? That is who we are. We serve the God that called Abraham. And, I, and when, I, when I first went to Bible school, all I wanted was... Tell me about Jesus. I got given my life back to the Lord. Tell me about Jesus. I don't want Old Testament. But if you don't know something about your heritage, you don't know something about your roots, you can't even understand where you are today. And, and a lot of times we forget this. We want to get so high-minded in church that we forget the basics. Abraham, wrestled, Abraham had Isaac. Isaac had Jacob. Jacob wrestled with God and became Israel. Israel had 12 sons. One of them was named Judah. From the tribe of Judah came a man named David. David had a covenant with God that leads us all the way to Jesus. That is our heritage. Amen? Somebody should clap and get excited about knowing who they are. Amen? Ephesians 1, 3 through 6 says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. Say, in Christ. in Christ. See, that's why I said all that about our heritage. We, our identity is in Christ. Amen? Why don't we have all those blessings? I thought about that. I, mean, I think about things like this. Okay, God, your word says that every blessing in heaven is ours, but we don't live them. How come? Well, we hold, even though we accept Christ as our Savior, we hold on to our past. We hold, hold on to our hurts. We hold on to our disappointments. And if your heart is filled up with all those hurts and disappointments that life brings, you don't have room for blessings. They're all ours. We have to make room for them. Amen. My favorite scripture in Ephesians goes on in chapter 4, verse 1. As a prisoner for the Lord, then I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. That word worthy is the most important word of that scripture. It's not talking about some religious worthiness where, hey, I'm saved, you're not. Walk around like you're better than everybody else. That word worthy, Paul is telling the Ephesians to walk, live balanced. You serve the king of kings. Walk around like you're a child of the king. It's easy to walk around like you're a child of the king when everything is going good, amen? But what about when things go bad? Remember in England, Princess Di. She was tragically killed. And up to now, and those boys are goofing off a little bit now, but up to now, her sons, what were her boys' names? William and Harry. William and Harry. Every picture you saw of those little boys from after she passed away, their heads were held high. You looked at those boys, those, those were royalty. You look at them, those young men, they're royalty. Their heads were held high. If children of a dead princess could walk around like there's something, how much more should children of a living king walk around like we are special? 
spiritually, every blessing in heaven is ours. Amen. It's easy to walk around with your head held high when you got your job, you got your mortgage paid, family's doing good, health is doing good. But what about when things go bad? How do you hold your head up? My mom gave us a great example this past year. My mom was called home to be with the Lord April, April 23rd. And she had a six-week fight. And through those six weeks, she held her head up. She had served the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob her whole life. And she wasn't letting a sickness define who she was. Circumstances should not define us. You know, we're not... Our, our life isn't defined this way, you know, where everything's going good, good, good. Oh, I got a problem. My head is down. Our life is defined this way. Our blessings come this way, up from heaven. You know, they come, they come down to us. 36 hours before the Lord called her home, she sat in the edge of her bed, and she raised her hands, and she worshiped the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That's called living worthy right there, walking worthy. I am a child of the living king. I walk worthy. But it still stings when we face life. Where, where's the family of young Christian? Where's Christian? God bless you guys. My heart goes out to you. We're praying for you guys. I went back to school after my mom was called home. And first day in class, everybody's phone was supposed to be off, but the professor took a call. And it was a church member that was being rushed to the hospital with a, uh, they didn't know if it was a heart attack. But he was going to the hospital, and he calls his pastor. They're taking me to the hospital. Something's wrong with my heart. So the pastor asked the class to pray. I'm in a season of being real and raw with God, and that's so important. How many people want to be real and raw with God? Just be transparent with God. Don't, don't put on airs. You know, don't put on, when you, when you pray, act like you're something different. God has caller ID. He knows who's calling. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're hurting because of the circumstances that life has dealt you. But you call him and go, Heavenly Father. You know, and he's like, oh, aren't you the one that's hurt right now? <laughs> so we got a prayer request to pray for this stranger. And as everybody started praying, here was my prayer. You want me to believe you'll heal a stranger, but you couldn't heal my mom. That's what I told God. Our God's thick skin. He's big enough to take our hurts, okay? Our, our, we're, not, we're, not, we're not Muslims where if we offend our God, we have to go on a riot, okay? Our God's skin so thick he can hang from the cross and say, I love you, all right? And I said, you want me to believe you'll hear this stranger, but you wouldn't heal my mom. And his answer to me was, I will be who I need to be in your life. That was a cold shot answer right there. I will be who I need to be in your life. And family, I want to encourage you. Let God be Lord. Win, lose, or draw, make him Lord of your life. Because sometimes we turn God into a good luck term. We get all the names of the characteristics of God. You know, we want him to be Jehovah, Jehovah Rapha, Jehovah Nisi. We get all the names down and we get so much head knowledge, we forget the most important name. And this is what he taught me. Let me be Lord. When we remember Jehovah Adonai, which is God our Lord, Lord our God, everything else will fall into place. Let God be who he needs to be in your life. And since that, that, that moment right there, I was able to surrender my hurt of losing mom, and I was able to just say, you're Lord. And with that right there, with that mentality, you can walk worthy of the calling in your life. And it's, it's never easy, but understand that this is a test. 70, 80 years is a test. No matter how many years on life is a test you have on here on earth. But if you draw 70 years and then take, put a dot right there, and then go to eternity. All you got to do during your test is walk worthy of the call. Amen? We serve the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We serve the creator of this universe. We serve the God who loves each and every one of us, and all he wants is a relationship with us. And when life comes at us and gives us hurt, what we learn to do so we can receive those blessings from heaven is surrender them to God. That's what I've learned in my life. Ten years ago, I lost mom last year. Ten years ago, I lost dad. And I wasn't serving the Lord. And that was my wake-up call. Because I was proud of my dad. Even when I wasn't serving the Lord, I would tell people about my dad. The heroin addict that went on to preach for 40 years. 
But it was six weeks after he passed that my son was born with gastroschisis. His intestines were outside of his body. And I walked out of the hospital to go get my wife's bag because we have to induce labor. When they told us we have to induce labor today. His kidneys are failing. He's fully exposed. We have to induce labor. I walked out of the hospital. I always have my cell phone with me. And I grabbed my phone. And I said, I got to call dad. And it hit me that my connection to heaven was gone. Because even though I wasn't serving the Lord, anytime there was a problem, dad, I need prayer. Dad, the kids are sick. Whatever was going on, dad, my marriage is in trouble. But this time I reached for the phone. Dad wasn't there. That's when God, that's when the Holy Spirit showed up as such a gentleman. And as I was walking through that parking lot, I felt like he put his arm around me and he said, time for you to be a man. Time for you to be the priest of your own family. And I asked Jesus into my heart, walking through the parking lot. And all I've done since then is try to serve him the best I can. And that's all he wants us to do is our best. I love that you have a cross, Pastor. That's the most powerful symbol in the universe right there. The yin and the yang are more pop popular and the peace sign is more popular. I googled it. You can google it. <laughs> Devil's not afraid of the peace sign. Devil's not afraid of the yin and the yang. Amen? Devil hates that sign right there. That's the most powerful sign. They, they, they put a they put a sign above it when they, named, when they killed Jesus. They called him king of the Jews. And the devil does that to us as we struggle in this walk. He'll put a sign on your cross. How many times, anybody experienced that where the devil starts accusing you, pointing your past to you? That's what he does to me. He reminds me of my past all the time. But when you read that scripture about pick up your cross and follow me, it doesn't say when you get your act together, follow me. It doesn't say when you have no issues in life, follow me. It doesn't say when your health is perfect, follow me. When everything is going great and the world wants to applaud you, follow me. He just says daily, pick up your cross. To me, that declares that everybody in here has a cross to bear. It's just a matter of choosing to pick up your cross and saying, just as I am, I'm going to follow you, Jesus. And when the devil, devil's a liar, but the one time he tells the truth, when he reminds you of your past and goes, you're not worthy. That's when I tell him, yeah, I know, but Jesus is worthy. It's not about me. It's about him. So pick up your cross, follow him, and receive your heritage. He wants to rob you of all those blessings that are promised to you by holding your past against you. He wants to accuse you. The Lord wants to excuse you. I just made that up. Can you write that down for me? I just made that up right there. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> Let's bow our heads and pray. Lord, we thank you for this night. It's a special night where we come to lift up our brothers and sisters and this beautiful child. We had some beautiful music, some good food, and some laughter. Lord, we stand before you as your children, and we raise up Christian. You are the God that heals. We're calling you on your promises, God. You are the God that's still in the business of making miracles. The doctor said my son would be in the hospital for four months in the incubator. It would be a month before he could eat. But one week later, he was eating. One month later, he was home. He was home. My son's 10. He doesn't have a scar on the body. We serve a God that's still in the miracle business, all right? Be encouraged. God, we call you on your healing powers. The blind man was healed at the gate because he called out to you, Jesus. He said, Yahshua, son of David, have mercy on me. He was telling you he knew who you were. And Lord, tonight we tell you right now, we pray to you by the name of your, by the name of your son, Jesus. We pray and we say we know you are the God that heals. You have promised us healing. We pray for this beautiful family. We pray strength. We pray comfort. But above all, we call you for a miracle. Because only you are the one that gives miracles. While all eyes are closed and every head is bowed, if you're in here tonight and you say that heritage you talk about, Dennis, I don't have a relationship with God. I can't receive my heritage because I don't know anything about him. If you'd like to have a relationship with Jesus Christ, just raise your hand. I would love to pray with you. 
Don't let the devil rob you of your heritage, okay? That's what the devil wants to do. He wants to strip you of the blessings that God wants to give you. If you'd like a relationship with Jesus Christ, there's no shame in saying, yes, I want a relationship with the God who created me. I want to get to know the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you're in here and you want a relationship, don't let the devil rob you one more night. Just raise your hand and we'll pray with you. Well, God bless you. And if you're in here and you say, I want to surrender the hurts that are robbing me from my blessings. I believe Jesus is my Savior, but I'm holding on to all the hurts that life has given me. If you want to surrender your hurts tonight, just raise your hand. We're going to pray with you. Just raise your hands. God bless all of you. The way I was real and raw with God and I told him how hurt I was that he didn't heal my mom, talk to him. Let him know about your hurts. He knows about them, but acknowledge him and say, God, I want to give you these. And when you surrender your hurts, your hands are free to worship. And when your hands are free to worship, you're, you're free to receive your blessings. Lord, you saw the hands that went up. Father, we pray right now for healing in all these lives. Father, as we surrender the hurts and disappointments that we've received. The devil is a liar, Lord, and we want to let go of the past. So right now, we surrender to you. and We pray healing into each and every one of those lives. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen and amen. Give Jesus a round of applause. Amen. <laughs> now, I will be, I'll be in the lobby. I'll be in the lobby. And tonight I came out. Pastor said, how much to come? And I said, nothing. I said, I want to come and I want to be part of the blessing of helping this family. But I have, I have a DVD that's available, and the most important part of the DVD is the testimony of healing in my marriage. My marriage was shattered. My wife filed for divorce. God told me to hold on. And in spite of all odds, we surrendered our marriage. He healed it, and that's been eight years. You know, so th that's the most important part of that DVD. So if you would like to support my ministry, this is what I do. You can grab a DVD, and what I'm going to do is from the DVD sales, I'm going to split them and give... Uh, give half the, half the proceeds from the DVDs to the family for this, this beautiful fundraiser, okay? Thank you very much. God bless you. What a beautiful guy, huh? Beautiful brother. Give him a hand. Hey, I want to get Lori up here because Lori is going to be helping you. A lot of you guys bought raffle tickets, and so we've got some exciting things to give away. Uh, kids are nice and safe. I went in there. They're just having a blast.